Our gospel lesson is from Mark chapter 13, verses 1 through 8. As you are able, I invite you to stand. Let us honor the reading of the gospel. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will this be? And what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Some of you may remember the phrase, too big to fail. Too big to fail was a phrase that we heard frequently in the 2008-2009 financial crisis. It's a phrase that's more of a theory. It asserts that there are certain institutions that are so large and so interconnected with other systems and institutions that their failure would be catastrophic and disastrous to the greater economic system. And therefore, their existence must be supported. They are too big to fail. Well, nobody told Jesus that. Today, Jesus is talking apocalyptic, symbolic, metaphorical language that to our modern ears sounds threatening and foreboding. He is telling his disciples that things are not as solid and secure as they seem to be. What appears to be immovable and unshakable and permanent is, in reality, an illusion. Now, we mainline Methodists, we don't like this kind of talk. This kind of talk belongs in churches out in the sticks. We like stability, status quo. We don't want to rock anybody's boat or anybody's world. So whenever we hear someone talking about disruption, dismantling the system, not one stone left on another, we put our heads in the sand. We don't want to hear that kind of talk. Just a few years ago, during the racial tensions that just seemed to ebb and flow in our nation, in the midst of chaos and protests, one African-American leader noted this, things are not getting worse, they are getting uncovered. We must hold each other tight and continue to pull back the veil. That's what apocalyptic language does. It uncovers what we prefer to remain covered. It brings to light things we wish to remain in the dark. It reveals the stuff that we've swept under the rug. Jesus and the disciples are walking through the temple courts, and one of the disciples notices the, the breathtaking splendor of the buildings, this, this massive temple. Teacher, Rabbi, look at these stones, look at these buildings, how huge they are. They're too big to fail. And who could blame the disciples for being so awestruck? The temple was indeed a magnificent place. 1.5 million square feet, 36 acres of polished marble, fine tapestries, gold-plated doors and gates that radiated the Jerusalem sun. At certain times of the day, you couldn't look at the gates because it just reflected 
the magnificence of the sun. Some of the smallest stones that went into the building of the temple weighed two to five tons. The largest stone was over 40 feet in length. These stones were so heavy they didn't need any kind of cement to keep them in place. They were held together just by their own weight. Even modern archaeologists are amazed by how these stones were transported. The temple was a place of power and glory. It was believed that the glory of God resided in the temple. The temple was also a personal vanity project for King Herod, who renovated it and rebuilt it to reflect his own greatness. It was a site of religious and national identity, an economic powerhouse. It created a lot of jobs. It was an anchor of security in an uncertain time for the Jewish people. In other words, it was too big to fail. For the Jews, the temple was not simply a building that, ha- that held sentimental value. The temple was foundational for them to understand who they were. It was the foundation of their identity, national, religious, economic, all of it. To give you an idea of the impact of the temple, the meaning of it, imagine the U.S. Treasury Building, the White House, the Capitol Building, and the Supreme Court Building, buildings that represent foundational aspects of our national life. And now imagine being told that 20 years from now, those buildings will be no more. They'll be leveled. Imagine the impact that would have on us. That's the kind of shock that the disciples would have experienced when they heard Jesus' words about the temple. Jesus looks at Herod's grand building project that took over 40 years to complete, and he says, you see all this? It's going to be gone. It'll come crashing down. Not one stone will be left upon another. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars, nations against nations, earthquakes and famines. It's interesting that the disciples, they look at the temple and they see certainty and permanence. But Jesus looks at the temple and he sees instability, not one stone being left upon another, all will be thrown down. Jesus is letting the disciples in on a kind of apocalyptic secret that the grand temple, the central place for devout Jews to worship, the institution that generates jobs and revenue and worship, the place where people come to get their sins forgiven, the place that houses the glory of God and the Holy of Holies, this temple that appears so permanent and fixed and eternal is going to be wiped off the map. Now, contrary to popular books and movies and TV preachers have all the stuff they've made of this particular passage. This really has nothing to do with what we call the so-called end times. Jesus' words were directed to the disciples who were standing around him that day. And every statement that Jesus makes in these verses came to pass, if you study history. Ancient historians noted that in the years after Jesus' death and resurrection, Many false messiahs appeared on the scene and led people astray. There were a number of wars that Rome engaged with, with nations around them during that time. There were a number of recorded earthquakes and famines that occurred during the lives of the disciples after Jesus' ascension. So Jesus is not so much predicting the certainty of the future, rather he is warning the disciples about the uncertainty of the present moment, about the the precariousness, the, the risk of putting faith in things that claim to be or appear to be eternal. He's also announcing the end of something, the end of the grand, glorious temple. And with this ending, God is going to bring about something new, a new temple, a greater temple. Sometimes things come to an end, but from those painful endings come 
new hopeful beginnings if you're willing to see them and embrace them. In December 1914, Thomas Edison's manufacturing facilities in West Orange, New Jersey were heavily damaged by a fire. Edison lost almost a million dollars worth of equipment and lost a lot of research. The next morning, walking about the charred embers of his hopes and his dreams, the 67-year-old inventor was reported to have said this, there is value in disaster. All of our mistakes are now burned up. Now we can start anew. One pastor has noted that there is no arrival of God without some sort of departure, no grasping of faith without some kind of letting go. In every move toward God, something is gained, but something is also lost and the loss is painful. I want us to note that Jesus tempers this apocalyptic language with words of hope. He says this, these, all these things are but the beginning of the birth pains. We often miss that in these verses. We have treated these words as such a threat to our life, our world, everything as we've come to know it, everything that will come to an end, that we miss this hopeful promise that our endings can be, by the grace of God, new beginnings. One pastor has said, sometimes what we call death is in the hands of God, birth. Only a living God can make an ending into a beginning. Whether you hear the gospel as good news or bad news may depend on where you are when you get the news. I remember reading about a man who went on a student mission trip with some college students. They went to Honduras uh, and uh, they set up in this impoverished town of San Marco. They set up a makeshift health clinic. And at the end, of the end of the day, they would gather around a campfire and they would listen to some of the villagers sing these beautiful native songs and they would share in a kind of devotion or vesper service. And one night during devotions, one of the students suggested that everybody go around and share their favorite Bible verse. So what is a verse or a passage that has given them comfort and hope in difficult times? And of course, people shared John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. One student shared, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. One of the Honduran villagers, a woman, said through her interpreter that her favorite verse was from this passage from Mark 13. Not one stone left on, on, not one stone, left on stone, earthquakes, famine, and fire, all will be thrown down. She said, that passage has always been a comfort to me. Students were taken aback by this, surprised by this, and so they asked the woman through the interpreter, what, what is it that is comforting? How is this passage comforting to her? And the interpreter said, you have to understand, this woman has seen her village decimated by war. She lost her husband in the war. Three of her five children died from malnutrition. So here is the woman who was not praying for the status quo to continue. She was not praying for life or the world to get a little bit better. She was praying for an end. She was praying for a time when all will be thrown down, when there would be a birth. She didn't want a better life. She wanted a new life. She didn't want simply a better world. She wanted a new heaven and a new earth. So for someone like me, someone who's never, have, never had to worry about food or clothes or having a roof over my head, when I hear Jesus say something along the lines of, you see this system that you've invested yourself in, uh, you see this life that you think is going to be permanent and, and certain, 
these things that you've been counting on, it's all going to be thrown down. Not one stone will be left upon another. It's hard for me to hear that God has no intention of preserving some of the things that I cherish. I hear this as bad news, but for people for whom my lifestyle has been made possible because of their expense, they hear Jesus' talk of an end, a disruption, they hear that as good news, gospel. Think about it this way, when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed and enacted and the slaves were freed, the southern plantation owners, they heard that as bad news. It was the end of their world as they knew it. It was a death. It was an end to their way of life. But to the slaves, emancipation was glorious good news. It was like a birth. It was the beginning of a whole new world. We in the modern mainline church in America, we're, we're going through a kind of apocalyptic time. Things that seem to be a bit foreboding, things are getting revealed, a time when it seems that things are dying, when things seem to be coming to an end, and it frightens us. We heard a little bit about this last week at our charge conference when our district superintendent, when, when Claire shared how the, the Methodist church started declining around the late 60s, early 70s. And we didn't acknowledge this or recognize it until the mid 80s. So we've got a 20 year gap when we refuse to re face the reality. And I think a big part of the reluctance to admit what the reality is, is that we want to cling to the reality as we have known it, the way it was 10 years ago, 15 or 20 years ago. But friends, to quote that great theologian, Dorothy Gale, we're not in Kansas anymore. You all shared uh, your responses to the listening session to those questions and I, I noted that these are the same responses that most churches are giving across the board and a lot of times in, in a lot of churches there's always this this movement this desire I wish we could just get back I wish we could go back we need to go back we, we wish we want this ministry to be the way it was 15 years ago, 20 years ago. We want this or that mission or ministry to be just like it used to be. But folks, I say this not with any kind of enjoyment or pleasure, and certainly not because I have all the solutions or answers. I say this because I feel it's my calling as your pastor to help us to name and see our current reality. There is no going back. It's become a kind of preacherly cliche to say that every church has a back to Egypt committee. You know? Uh, in, remember in Egypt, the story of the, uh, the, the Exodus, how in Egypt Israel was enslaved to them, uh, and God raised up Moses, and Moses led the people out of the out of the uh, out of bondage to Egypt and into the wilderness and all along the way there was a group of people that always said you know things are better back in Egypt we need to go back I mean yeah sure we were slaves but at least we got three meals a day we had a roof over our heads we had a schedule uh, the food was decent and uh, you know we had dental insurance so that was a nice perk we need to go back to Egypt here's the thing Egypt always looks better than the wilderness. Egypt always looks better than the wilderness. But guess where God was calling Israel to go? In the same way, the status quo, the past, always looks better than the present or the future. The past always looks better than the new thing that God is doing. But guess where God is calling us? Every workshop I attend, every book or article on ministry that I've read, every podcast that I've been listening to for the past few years, all say the same thing. 
Churches that are trying to recreate the past, get back to the past, they're only fooling themselves. What worked 10 or 15 years or so ago to draw people to the church is now outdated. In fact, it's no longer about getting people out there to come here, to come to us. The name of the game now in mission and ministry is getting the church out into the community to go out and build small group relationships with people. So in line of this, it makes us pause and just to wonder a little bit, what are the things in our lives that we assume are permanent? To what traditions or beliefs do we cling to to try to maybe house God or box God in? Why do we cling to certainty when Jesus invites us on an adventure of trust in the midst of uncertainty? Are we willing to acknowledge the fact that things fall apart and things come to an end, even the most cherished and beloved things, like memories, like people, like the way we've always done things, Here's the thing about God. God doesn't promise that we're going to avoid the ruin. God doesn't promise that we're going to not experience the ruin, but rather God promises that there is life on the other side of the ruin. God promises us new life on the other side of death. We've just got to be willing to go through dying in order to be raised. We've got to be willing to die to our assumptions about what we've always thought church is and was. And it helps us to remember that we follow a resurrected Lord who's already handled death on our behalf and came out victorious. I want us to take a look at this image there. And in case you can't see it, I hope you can see it, there's kind of a dilapidated wall that's crumbling, and uh, there's a ladder, and there's a man standing looking over the wall, and you see kind of the, what's on the other side of the wall there. And in case you can't see it, on the uh, right side of the wall, there is a phrase, and it says, the beginning is near. The beginning is near. So I want, what I want us to do is I want to take just a few moments and I want you to partner up maybe with people around you or a person next to you and just talk about what do you see in this image? What did it take for this man to go up this ladder and peer out over into the new world that is emerging? What other things pop up for you as you look at this image? So I want you to take 90 seconds to sort of discuss what are some things that you see uh, what did it take for this man to go up that ladder and peer out at the new world unfolding? Okay, we're going to think deep. So I hope you got your coffee, brought your coffee with you. So take 90 seconds and go. Okay, let's come back together and see if we can pool our answers together. So what are some things, just some general things you notice about this picture? Scary looking ladder, looks a little bit of a rickety, risky ladder, yeah. So it's a risk for him to go up, all right, what else? What's that? You can't see all that's on the other side of the wall, you can see sort of a sneak preview. So. Somebody else out, out here has something? Mm -hmm. Everything is dark and gloomy. It looks like this is sort of an, uh, an old world that is dying, uh, coming down. And on the other side is something new. We just sort of get a, a glimpse of it. The grass is always greener on the other side. Yes, he had to be willing to go up this ladder, take a step. He had to be willing 
to believe, uh, maybe he saw this, these words on the wall and took that as a sign. The beginning is near. All around him, at least on this side of the wall, uh, it looks like an end. It looks like this is all there is. But he had to be willing to take a risk to go and peer out on the other side of the wall. What else? He had to have, yes, had faith that there, so he had to leave behind, uh, in, a, in a sense, had to leave behind, be willing to risk that there was something else on the other side of the wall, a new beginning. The future is not what it used to be, that's right, that's right. It takes courage to change. Yes, before you climb up land, you have to get off your duff. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just a fascinating image uh, and just an interesting phrase. The beginning is near. Bishop Will Willimon once defined the gospel, the good news of Jesus, as this. The good news is God is going to get what God wants no matter how much God's got to mess up what you've got in order to get it. <laughs> in light of that, maybe it is true after all that things aren't getting worse, they're just getting uncovered. And we must hold each other tight and let Jesus continue to pull back the veil. Thanks be to God. Amen.